Welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Rio Wincoller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this cider centric podcast where we interview makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. This week we have Aaron Bell and Nicole Legrand Lebon. They are both at Silo Distillery based in Windsor, Vermont. This distillery is now producing cider. And we're going to be speaking to both these gals coming straight up. But first, let me catch you up with a bit of news out and about in Ciderville. Rhea, <coughs> should we take two? So you could say what episode number this is. And just in case you don't know, Rhea, it is episode 189, which is quite a few podcast episodes all on cider. And might I also add Perry. (laughs) I know, Palms. I know. Uh, You know, look, it's a summer. I've gone to this biweekly schedule. Uh, We're kind of doing this little unscripted. Uh, I I think the listeners have it, don't you? I do, Rhea. Thank you very much, Medlars. Uh, And since you all have chimed in, let me introduce who you are to the listeners of Cider Chat, especially the new folks out there who are tuning in for the first time. We had Mr. Quince. (coughs) Pleasure. And Perry Pear. I honestly do not know how anyone cannot know that I am Perry (coughs) Pear. Perry. And allow me to also introduce the Medlars. Yes, all these palms are best known as the Talking Palms, and they are in the Cider House with me, helping me produce the podcast to bring it to you. And this week, we have a doozy of a podcast, don't we? Indeed we do, Rhea. There's quite a bit going on for us. I'm packing for London. Oh, yeah, London. Who would have thought that uh, a chain of events would happen where all of a sudden we are headed to not only London, but West Country, out to the Ross Cider Fest that's going to be taking place at the end of August through the weekend that we know in the U.S. as Labor Day weekend. Uh, It's going to be quite a time being in the midst of so many cider fans and makers. Uh, What an opportunity. It's just just fantastic. (coughs) I'm really looking forward to it, Rhea. I know, Mr. Quince, and I think the folks in the U.K. are looking forward to meeting you, too. Uh, seeing that you have some big fans here. Uh, one in particular comes to mind, which is James Forbes. Uh, he and Susanna Forbes have a little Pomona cider. That's in the Herefordshire, or the Shire, as they call it. And I'm hoping that you won't be, you know, too shy, Mr. Quince, to not have a chance to meet them. <coughs> Don't bother with me. I'll just be in the orchard. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Quince. <laughs> Oh, boy. Anyways, hey, look, Palms, we're going to keep on moving on here. I want to, we'll continue talking about London and and the UK and the Ross Cider Fest as we're going through it. And of course, there's going to be the flip side when we come back with a bunch of recordings from that. But let's take a little pause here and bring out some other news happening out and about in Ciderville, too. Cue up the music, Mr. Quince. <laughs> One, two, three. If you live in the Southern Hemisphere, it's winter time. So you have already made your cider, and now you're on the other side of that. For those of us who live in the Northern Hemisphere, we are getting ready for the fall harvest. And so we must be thinking, what are we going to do? How are we going to source our apples? Are we going to get apples, or are we going to buy juice? For myself, I do a little bit of both. Uh, Actually, last year, I didn't press any apples because my press needs some work on it. And luckily, uh, a couple weeks ago, I brought some of the parts that needed welding to the welder, and hopefully I'll be able to pick that up this week. Going to give them a call. So I'm preparing now for next month, like more like October, November, when I'll be pressing hopefully some apples and pears that I'll be scrumping here and there. So I'm 
already, you know, looking for those apple trees and I want to grab some apples from because I don't really have that many apples uh, in my yard, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> you might think I do, but I don't. Anyways, uh, you want to think about that. And the other piece I just want to talk to you today about, because this is really important to start planning now, is what kind of yeast are you going to use? Yeast is really informative <laughs> in terms of the kind of profile of cider that you're going to be making. So it's time to kind of delve into that a bit and thinking about yeast. Do you want to just let the ambient yeast, what what is in the cider house or on your cider mill, take take over? I did that last year. I had some good luck and some not so good luck. So there's a risk to it. Or do you want to pitch yeast? And that would be buying a commercial yeast They come in like a dry packet form or in a liquid vial, and you pour that into your fresh pressed apple juice and let it go. Uh, So each yeast, you should know, will lend a certain characteristic to the cider. For many years, I early on, I used quite a bit of... uh, Champagne yeast, which could could really dry out the cider, and I I love that style. Or you might be like me, where you've come from like brewing, where you made beer. And so I've used Saison yeast, that would typically be for a Saison style beer. Really, the sky is the limit. And what I, I do recommend, if you can, is to get a few yeast. So let's say all you could handle, all you could afford is two five-gallon batches. If you're new to cider making, I would say pitch yeast because that will really kind of control that vessel of cider that you have going and you'll have at least a good sense of what the final product's going to be. And try two different kinds of yeast there. In fact, in this feature chat this week, Nicole is going to be talking about the yeast that she uses for the cider made at Silo. And I think you're going to find that very, very interesting. I certainly did. And uh, and informative for your own cider making. So there's a lot of past cider chat episodes where I'm talking about yeast. I had the yeast whisperer on. And you could go back to all those episodes. But for now, all you need to do is, you know, Go, hopefully, hopefully you have a local homebrew shop. That's typically what they're called, homebrew, not the cider shop, where you could buy packets of yeast, talk to the proprietor. Uh, in my area, we have a, a store called Beerology. Uh, online, there are d- lots of places to buy yeast and all different descriptors of what that yeast will or will not do for you. So that is something to think about now. Get your yeast. Do not wait to the last minute to get your yeast because right now it seems a lot of us need to order that online and that takes time. And so you want to have that yeast in hand. So that's I'm going to just leave it like that. Order your yeast. Get with it now. Start making plans for making cider. It's coming up. There is a reason why we do it like this. Ba-dum, ba-dum. There is a reason why we do it like this and why we drink it like this. It's because we like cider and cider equals fun. That is sung by myself and my cousin Jane. If you want to hear the full song, just wait till the end of this year podcast. There is a ton of great news happening in my spot of Ciderville, which I never get to speak enough about. I just heard from Bear Swamp Orchard that's based up in Buckland uh, in my county that they are now going to have brandy, apple brandy available. They've been distilling besides making cider. So that might be available if you're in this area. Keep an eye out for that. Also, New Salem Preserves that has been mentioned many times on this podcast is now producing cider. Their cider garden is open during the summers. It's outdoors overlooking the Quabbin Reservoir. Absolutely spectacular. 
Uh, most days you could kind of show up and get a crawler to go. That's 32 ounces of cider. They had two ciders on tap. I had them both. They're delicious because I know the maker. He's an award-winning cider maker, now gone commercial, working with Carol B. Hillman, who is 92 years old. And she's going to be on this podcast because I just recorded an episode with her talking about how she brought back that orchard and has been working on it for 50 years. <laughs> well, put that in your pipe and smoke it. And then other good news is Artifact Cider has now relocated back to Western Mass. They used to be in the Springfield area, then they went out to, to the Boston area, and now they are making cider in Florence, which is right outside of Northampton, downtown Northampton. Florence is a really happening scene, and we're just so happy for for Artifact, what they're doing. They have a tasting room, and they are open Thursday through Sunday. So that is good news there. Walk into the orchards Dancing in the streets Smelling all the blossoms Kicking up our feet Hoo-wee! I just got a knock on the door between now and that little uh, pause there, and there was a cider delivery from none other than Eden Specialty Cider. So I opened up the box, which was very nice presentation, I want to say. Uh, there was... Uh, a letter. I'm going to read it right now. Signed by none other than Eleanor Leger. She is the gal behind Eden Specialty Ciders. They're based up in Newport, Vermont, which is just on the border of Canada. And they have a cider bar right outside of Burlington, like a stone's throw. Like, you know, you stand on the little walkway of Burlington, Vermont, you throw a stone, you're going to hit their cider bar. If, 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 you have a really good arm. <laughs> Anyways, they're up in Winooski, Vermont. It, it is really definitely just a stone's throw away doing some nice small plates there and pouring their fantastic cider. So let me let me share with you what just came. I want you to get thirsty here for cider because that's the whole goal of this whole program here. Uh, written by Eleanor, and she says, We are excited to share our second edition Harvest Cider with you. And it says Eden, second edition on it, and Harvest Cider, more flavor, less sweet, is 6.4% alcohol by volume in these sweet little four-pack of cans. And she says, the cider is made like wine, no beer. We produce one batch per year, press near harvest when the fruit has its best flavor. Age to develop a fruit character and canned without adding anything. No preservatives, no added sugar of any kind, no back sweetening with pectinized juice or concentrate, no preservatives. God damn it. No, she did right. God damn it. I, just, I mean, look, she's putting out the whole list here just so we can know this is 100% juice and it's just fermented. Uh, goes on with the apples for the cider are grown locally and sustainably. Our mission is to support the small orchards that keep our beautiful working landscape going. The apples for the cider are all grown locally and sustainably. And she also says it's not a recipe. The, this cider won't be consistent from year to year, just like you don't expect wine to taste exactly the same from vintage to vintage. The weather during the growing season and the biennially bearing nature of apple trees mean that we will have different blends of apple in each year's harvest of cider. That is why we call it Harvest Cider. Oh, that, hey, that is pretty smart. I like that branding there. And I could tell you without even cracking this can open right now, that is going to be delicious. But you know what? I'm going to crack this can open right now. So here we go. Oh, oh my God. It just popped apple. Apple. I'm going to drink it right from the can too. Here we go. Because you know, it's, only, it's not even 12 o'clock, but who cares? Mm. Thank you, Eleanor, for making another fantastic cider. Look, Ciderville, if you don't know about Eden Specialty Ciders, Google them. I'm going to have a link in the show notes. Eleanor is a force to be reckoned with. She's on the United States Association of Cider Makers Board again. She was before she came back on. She was helping the Vermont 
Association of Cider Makers get rolling. She has a cider cidernomics blog that she was working on. I'm not sure if she's working on it currently because she's so darn busy. She helps many people understand ice cider that was brought down from Canada and helps let them understand how to make it, make it well. She is just a lovely person. And maybe that's the most important thing to know about Eleanor. She's a lovely person who works her ass off for cider and makes really delicious cider. I mean, this cider here, it, it isn't sweet. It's, it's exactly what it says on the can. Harvest cider, more flavor, less sweet. I'm going to have another sip here. Mm. The carbonation level is spot on. Sometimes when I, I have a carbonated cider, it kicks up into my nose really quickly, and I can't talk at the same time, and... Um, the carbonation really affects me. This is really on a nice level. Uh, the blend here, I'm having some um, tannic structure in there. And the sweetness is uh, the both, it's like a semi-sweet, not coyingly sweet at all. A really full mouth flavor cider. This cider is going to get me through this podcast right now. And you know what? There's three more cans waiting, and they'll be open on Sunset Cider Club this week. Thank you, Eden Specialty Ciders, for kicking out in Vermont. Bravo. Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Well, now that I cracked open a, a cider midday, I think this is a very good time to go to the featured chat with both Aaron and Nicole and to delve into what they're doing at Silo. I found it super informative and quite a a sight to to visit the the congeniality there being greeted as soon as i walked in the door with a little beaker of cider by nicole the dogs coming up to me greeting me and walking right up to this giant still that is it's enormous in height really high and aaron's going to be talking about that then the three of us walk through the tasting room and then out onto the front porch that overlooks this area where there's a number of different craft artisanal products such as Harpoon Brewery is there, now making City Root Cider. Vermont Cheese is there. And then there's also Blake Hill Specialty Preserves. So it's a a little kind of uh, tourist stop, if you will, with really great quality products. So Vermont, so New England. And I was getting to hang at Silo Distillery, talking with some really informed women on the products that they're making. So make sure that you could catch up with me now and fill your glass with some cider and and kick back and enjoy this chat with both Aaron Bell and Nicole Legrand Laban of Silo Distillery, based in Windsor, Vermont. <laughs> I'm the head distiller and production manager at Silo Distillery. I'm Nicole Legrand Lebon, and I am the cider maker and assistant distiller at Silo Distillery. I started doing the distilling here in 2015 when our first distiller left. I've been with the company since 2013 as a marketing director, and I learned the process in order to market it better, basically to tell the story better. Um, and then when he left out of the blue, I sort of had to take that over. Um, eventually I found our last distiller, Chris, to replace me, who left this past September, and that's when I came back on as head distiller. How did you learn how to distill? When, where did that come from? Did you go to school for that, or was that... Uh, no, I, I learned down? on the job here. Um, our first distiller, Ray, was an engineer, um, and he sort of taught himself um, some of the ropes. And then since then, I've just done a lot of self-educating. Uh, I follow a lot of distillers. I have absolutely no problem asking what other people might think are dumb questions in order to find out um, what people have learned through trial and error. I've done my own trial and error, made my own mistakes, and learned from those. I have a tendency to really 
immerse myself in a thing then I become passionate about it and turn into a bit of a sponge so uh, just sort of in application that's been the whole process from start to finish getting out all the equipment and my dad was an engineer so being confident around machinery has really lent itself to that as well and what kind of still do you have we have a Carl still it's from Germany it's considered a hybrid pot and column still um, we have two columns, a four plate finishing column and a 21 plate um, vodka column. Uh, and then we also have an extended helmet for gin runs for flavoring. And what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I have an affection towards spirits. I've always wanted to distill. Uh, I wish it was legal to distill in the U.S. as a hobbyist. Uh, because I feel like that's really set our craft overall quite a bit backwards in the U.S. Mm -hmm. in that way compared to other countries. But what does it mean, like a double plate for vodka versus gin? I mean, what does that mean? The way I like to describe the distillation process when talking to people who don't have a lot of education is it is basically it's like the harder you make the spirit work, the cleaner it gets. So our column and pot still acts like an obstacle course for alcohol. Um, as you bring the heat up, and alcohol has a lower boiling point than water, as you bring the heat up, it goes through phase change from liquid to vapor, and it travels along a specific path. And every time it runs into an obstacle, like a plate, or the walls of the column, or the walls of the still, it turns back into a liquid, drops back down, has to go through the whole process again, and it's getting more and more pure as it goes, um, until it passes sort of what's considered, we consider the last obstacle, which is the, the phlegmator, um, which is a cold plate, a plate full of cold water at the top of each column. And once it gets past that, it cools back down in the spirit. And then we start making what we call our cuts. Um, and the cuts are happening throughout different types of alcohol coming through. Um, there's probably hundreds of different versions of the alcohol molecule that come through. Uh, and we only want certain ones. Um, so the first part, the first cut we would make is for the heads cut. That's the really pure... Uh, hot stuff um, like the methanols and the high-end ethanols um, we don't want those because that's what's going to make our product burn um, so we'll collect those in and separate when, when vessels. you say burn you're saying burn on, in the mouth on the yeah, palate. Yeah that's that yeah. really hot that's stuff hot. Yeah. Um, and that's that's pretty significant um, of a headier cut um, if you're getting a spirit that's got a lot of burn um, that's not to say that tails cut also doesn't have some sort of burn, but the tails end will be more fusel oils, lower purity alcohols. Mm -hmm. We also don't want those um, just for the fact that they also cause the worst hangovers. <laughs> so mm -hmm. does, we don't want that. So does lack of moderation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's well, also, it, it takes... It's, I always thought it was like top shelf, drink top shelf and you won't have a hangover, no? It's, it is true. I mean, yeah. you're getting the purest, cleanest stuff. Um, you're body is not going to have to work as hard to filter it out but you know all things in moderation alcohol will never be considered good for you so <laughs> but the, the higher quality stuff that you buy and consume the better off you're going to be uh, and so we collect what we consider the heart of the run and we don't collect our tails at all we just stop collecting when we get to the end of our heart run um, and we throw the rest away you have the opportunity to recycle into future batches. Um, some places do that for flavor. It's not typically something you would do for flavor in vodka as a neutral grain spirit, um, but you might do it for whiskeys, maybe even for brandies as well. Um, we don't. We've just found that we consistently like the quality that we're getting first run through. Um, it's also a space and storage issue. Mm. So we don't really have a lot of space and storage. Um, so to hang on to stuff that we're not entirely sure is going to even yield the results that we want doesn't make sense in an efficiency standpoint. So if I had a humongous warehouse, maybe I'd dabble in that a little bit. But, um, so the different plates throughout the columns will allow you to get to different purity levels. Um, and our whiskey column is the shorter column because you don't need it to be as pure. Those impurities, I say in quotes because they're not necessarily negative things in that case, uh, lend themselves to the flavor development that the whiskey does in the barrel. Um, and so that stuff usually comes up to about 175 proof off the still, and we won't start collecting it till 160 proof. That's per federal standard. You have the distillation piece here, but it, to distill spirits, and you know, we're talking about vodka, whiskey, gin, 
and brandy, right? And there's different kinds of brandy, right? Mm -hmm. Blueberry or, you know, yeah. or, or uh, an apple brandy. Mm -hmm. It's not just that, it's, it's distilling it, but then also storing it and conditioning it. So your facility is how big? What's the square footage here? Oh, good Lord. Uh, I'd probably say I would be generous at maybe 9,000 square feet. Yeah. 8,000, 9,000 square feet. Okay. I mean, we have high vaulted ceilings, um, so we kind of lose the second floor and part of it, but that's what happens when you have a, a still that's <laughs> two, two, two stories tall. Right. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So it's it looks really cool, cool, but you lose some storage there. So probably like eight or 9,000 square feet. Um, and yeah, we do everything in here. This is the bonded space, so this is where everything exists. We have some storage for bottles uh, across the parking lot at the Cheesemakers. Oh, um, so cool. some dry goods and stuff, packaging, things nice. that don't need, ha don't have any shelf life and stuff. But everything's pretty much done in this one big building. And all the barrels uh, are stored here too. I'm yep. seeing a lot of like, uh, well, what are the classic size barrels that you have here? So we actually have much smaller format barrels than what we considered classic. The classics are usually around uh, 40 and 53 gallon. Uh, we started out with 10 gallon. We've, we moved up to 10 and 15s. We've done a couple 25s and right now we're predominantly doing 30 gallons for our bourbon. Those are actually made by the first Vermont Cooper in decades. Um, made from Vermont wood, so we're super excited about that relationship. And what's that cooperage that you were? That's Green Mountain Green and Barrel. They're based out of Richmond, Vermont, so they're just south of Burlington. Now let's talk about that since we're there. Uh, the wood for the barrels is that all locally harvested? So this is a funny story. Um, it was originally locally harvested, um, but then the guys started having trouble. Um, getting lumber mills to sell them Vermont white oak because other larger distilleries in the state had been buying them out um, in tens of thousands board feet and then sending it out of state to other cooperages to build them and send them back into state to be Vermont barrels but made by out of state makers. Wow. Yeah. So these guys kind of came on in the last couple of years and they were at a disadvantage in that. Um, but because I also have a business in woodworking, um, I have some connections in New England who have mills, and one of which is a good friend down in Connecticut who has a lot of white oak at his fingertips. And so we've actually been able to establish a relationship between Vermont Green and Barrel and Under the Bark. These Vermont oak barrels are a little tightly wound, and they don't release their sugars as readily as wow. my Midwestern oak. Oh, yeah. um, so we're wondering if this shoreline white oak from Connecticut might lend a different characteristic, and we're super excited. That decision to go with that smaller capacity barrel based upon the fact of what was available or because of something here at the... So initially in the beginning of our barrel aging program, so it probably started back in like 2014, mm -hmm. um, it was basically about turnover and it was about not having produced a bourbon before, so not okay. wanting to commit to larger volumes of inventory that we wouldn't be able to turn over for years. Um, it's much yeah. easier to work in smaller batches in smaller sizes. Um, right. to get a feel for what we're going to turn right. out. Right. Um, and then it, as we developed the whiskey, uh, and the, especially the bourbon, um, and became more confident in the recipe and what was going to come out of it, moving to larger formats worked in our favor. But we're still, uh, we're still producing what would be considered younger bourbon. Like right now it's coming out around 20 months, so less than two years. It's a sweeter one. It's a little less color. Um, and some people you know, don't consider it the best way to do bourbon, but we've not been able to keep it on the shelf. So well, tell me, tell me how, how do you get a sweet bourbon? Well, bourbon is, so by nature, bourbon, it has to be more than 51% corn, um, and it has to be done in new barrels. So there's two different things right there that are already lending themselves to having a sweeter product. It's just corn is just a sugar forward grain, and new barrels are freshly charred wood, which means it's the freshest sugar from the lignin that you can get. But your mash bill will determine what happens after that. We have a pretty predominantly corn bourbon. It's 70% corn, 30% uh, rye. So it's definitely going to be on the sweeter side anyways. The, everybody's mash bill is a little different. You start throwing things like wheat in there and it'll dry it out. Yeah. Or oat and it'll make it creamier. I mean, wow. And then the longer it does stay in a barrel, it will start to sort of round out and lose a little sweetness and gain a little spice. Um, just because it's the nature of the sit. Um, but when you use lot smaller barrels, you also have a higher ratio of spirit to wood 
like the ratio is much closer as far as like bigger barrels where there's a lot more spirit and a lot less wood surface. Mm -hmm. So it will also sort of lend itself to be a little bit more sweet. And you're saying it's gone off the shelves. Yeah, we haven't been able to keep it in stock since we started producing it. So. Uh -huh. it's that, that because of like the the classic American palate is more sweet? Actually, no. Uh, we have a tendency to get a little bit more criticism from more uh, seasoned bourbon drinkers. Oh. And oh. we have a tendency to open up the palates of people who didn't think they liked whiskey at all. So... Bravo. Yeah. yeah. Why not? We don't mind that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, you know, we, there's so many different palettes out there. Are you doing a barrel aging program? We are. We just started developing it. So the one that we're about to release at the end of August, which will be the first batch that we've had available on the markets for a little over a year, um, which is also the first batch to come out of these Vermont barrels. It's the oldest batch we've ever had, so it's over 20 months, um, and now we are set up to have a rotation of around 150 gallons of bourbon every quarter. Um, so we have actually built our program to support the sales, and then from there we reuse our bourbon barrels for other whiskey styles that we do and other new projects that we're working on. Um, we've also used it to age some of our cider, and we've considered using it to dabble in brandy in the future. Nicole just brought out some vodka in a little tin cap, cup here for Erin, <laughs> and she stuck her finger in it and I believe put it in the center of your tongue. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us what you're doing here? So, uh, yeah. Well, I brought it out to Erin because she's still teaching me how to do the cuts, mm -hmm. and I feel like I've got the head cuts mostly down, um, and then Erin's still sort of teaching me how to get to the end cuts and so I tend to get a little nervous about things because I am learning the mm -hmm. flexibility and the edges and so I brought the tin cup full of high proof stuff straight off the still to make sure that it still should be running. <laughs> and it's probably a little important to point out that um, our process is much more hands-on uh, and it's a much more sensory based um, cutting process. It's not automated. Uh, we don't have a fully developed digital system. We weren't really interested in that. So we actually taste, feel, smell um, throughout each cutting point. Uh, we're looking for certain identifiers when we're working on that. That's basically built on the palettes that we have and the product that we've been producing, which I try to tell Nicole is, it's a little bit more flexible in whiskey just because it's a little more there's a more developmental process there and vodka is a little bit tighter with the neutral yeah. grain um, but it's still like I always like to tell her every cut is a moment for self-expression um, you are buying product that is based off of a couple people's palettes and so you might not fall in line with them but we do have a certain quality standard and you know clean light bright um, just a touch of sweetness that'll probably get end up getting cleaned out during the filtration process because we do carbon filter um, our vodka. Um, so it's coming off is still at 191 proof, so I'm not going to take a big swig of it because I have stuff to do today. <laughs> <laughs> the best way to taste it is to take just a little couple droplets on your finger, put it in the middle of the palate so you're not overwhelming every part of it, and then be able to get a good sense of what the taste is going to be. If you were to put it on the tip of your tongue, it would automatically burn. If you put it too far back, you just lose it. Um, and then another point, you would probably want to roll it around your hands see if it's oily or viscous at all. Um, if it dries really cool and really fast, you're probably still in the hearts in your nice spot. And if it lingers for a while and it's still viscous after like a few seconds, you might be moving into those fusel oils. Um, I also tell her, I'm not very scientific in my language, so I base a lot of my stuff on storytelling and experience. So I told her if it starts tasting like a tin can you left out in the rain, then you probably don't want to keep it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually works really well for me because I'm like, oh, okay. And then I can get the mental image of that and I think, yeah, that doesn't taste so good. I don't want that in my vodka either. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. <laughs> But it's easy to teach, and we do a lot of tours, and we do a lot of classes and stuff, so developing language that people can find relatable really makes it easy for them to feel involved in what they're learning about. Absolutely. So, so may I yeah. taste that and, and, and tell you what I'm experiencing? So I put my finger in, and I get a little bit of sweetness there, um, and then I'm going to just kind of rub my, my fingers. It feels a little, little oily to me still, mm -hmm. so is that... Am I, 
right on there. What? They're all kind of. I mean, I kind of wish I had brought more. you some of the head cuts, because um, that that's actually really nice. It's still really dry. It doesn't stick around for a really long time. Like it, you rub it around, your fingers move smoothly, mm. but it doesn't stay for very long. No, not and at And then all. when it leaves, your fingers almost feel really smooth. Mm -hmm. Like it's almost like you yeah. feel this nice skincare product. I, I just very that. weird. Right. <laughs> no, I never really understand I why it's doing that. Probably wouldn't be um, what you'd want to use as a skincare product. But no. It does well, it's really great for making bug bites stop itching. I'll tell you that much. Oh, um, right. So those horsefly bites sure. this time of year. Um, and then yeah, when you smell it, it's always good to not overwhelm your nose but it's nice and clean um it's not it's just not a lot of additional uh chemical to the nose it's just it smells like alcohol now yeah i mean this smells like alcohol it feels a little um fusel i want to say fusel and like um i get a little bit of briny stuff out of it sometimes briny. at this point yeah. And um, which like I really a, like. Yeah, that piece. tends to go way through the filtration as well. But I just, I, I don't know. It makes me really want a martini. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not even twelve o'clock, right? Yet, but that's okay. <laughs> so th I mean, this is a fun job. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see. I have a lot more to learn, obviously. And then spending that's time with it is, yeah, is the best. Exactly. Thing. And, you know, it's a bit. Your experience is always going to be different when you go to different places, too. The machinery never looks the same. The raw materials are never the same. I mean, we're lucky. We have a really clean water source. That's a big part of it. We have really consistently high-quality grain from one farm. We've been doing that for six years. Um, oh, and where, where's that located? Is North that Clarendon. So uh, it's, it's local. Yeah, it's about 45 minutes from here. Um, and, and that is also Vermont? Yep. Clarendon, it's, North, it's, yeah, right, yeah. it's just south of Rutland. Okay. Um, yeah. And yeah. it's Grembowitz Farm. Um, it's a father and son running operation. Wonderful. Yeah, he wow. like hand delivers all the grain for us. Wow. And stuff. He's wow. super proud of it. Yeah. Well, that's that's pretty Vermont proud there, right? Right. Yeah. Right off the bat. So this is an interesting factor here. So you have a product that you're making where you're able to to get your raw material to make your finished product pretty easy. I mean, even if that farm was down for a season. For whatever reason, you would still be able to bring in that raw material. Yeah, working. It's it's really nice in Vermont. I you know, still use 20% of the land for agriculture. I mean, grain production is consistently high in the state. So it's fantastic. Fingers crossed, we never have to do it. But if we had to, we could probably find other corn providers. Right. We'd still probably have a question about consistency because this is really high quality corn. It's not just like your general feed corn. Um, he handpicks what we do. Uh, he's not wow. organic or non-GMO certified because he's surrounded by other mass market fields that... But but he's not he's clean. not using any of those kind of mm -hmm. GMOs or anything himself, mm -hmm. but it could be some wind blown. He's very selective of, uh, about which seeds he uses and who he works with. Um, I think he mostly gets them through a company in Pennsylvania, um, all the seeds that he's been using for a very long time in their family-run company. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it's, it's nice to work with people who are super proud in how they source their materials. And when you are selling this product, you're putting in at what kind of size bottles? 750s and 375s. Um, 375. So okay. we, at, we mostly sell the Small 375s products. in um, variety packs because we have a couple of flavored vodkas as well throughout the distillery. Um, and then the larger bottles are sold throughout the state and in New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, and Chicago right now. We just got in Chicago. And Nicole, how about you? When did you come on here? I started working here last September. Um, I was asked to consult for their cider making, and so I uh, thought that would be interesting. And then once I agreed to do that, they said, are you interested in learning how to distill? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> and... Um, so I had been making cider since 2000, and so... Um, Gosh, when this fall comes around, this will be my 20th harvest for apples. So um, learning something new was really appealing to me. You have this product, the, the distillery product, where it's like infinite resources at your hand in terms mm -hmm. of raw material. Mm -hmm. But we know with cider, that's not necessarily the same. Right. Well, for you coming here to Silo and bringing your knowledge and wisdom and making cider and being in that industry for for how many years well, this will be 20 years 20 years so yeah um it it was a change for sure because i had always been making heritage cider 
And so this is also single orchard sourced. We're using our apples from Moore's Orchard in Pomfret, Vermont. It's sort of 20 minutes away from here. But this is common cider. And so I think a lot of cider makers go the other way where they've started out with something common. They're using uh, culinary and dessert apples and then they try to switch to heritage. And for me to go from heritage to using apples when it, when I first got here they said okay here's your juice <laughs> and I thought uh oh <laughs> and I, I asked the farmer what varieties were in it and I got a couple of vague answers like you know one of the batches was heavy to northern spy um, and I could taste things that I sort of recognize as a little bit of Macintosh but because it was a nice blend um, even though I did four different fermentation batches it came out fairly consistent um but it was it, personally for me it was a challenge to make sure that using fruit that even the farmer declared was meant for you know fresh juice consumption as opposed to cider consumption um i needed to make sure that i was making something clean and something that would be consistent enough. And I was pretty pleased with it. I, it's, you know, it's, it's clean and it's crisp. And it, um, I, I've never particularly liked sweet cider. So um, I tend to, I mean, it's fairly dry, actually. Um, but it's uh, it was a it was a different thing to do for sure i'm sure it was it must have been like what am i doing here yeah and i um i mean i got sort of handed down a fantastic yeast that i wasn't familiar with too that uh is produces low or no amounts of hydrogen sulfide so that actually really helped in being able to get things turned around and um uh, reduce the maturation time can so you talk that a little was bit nice. more about the yeast there? Yeah, it's called Viva. Uh, apparently it's a branded yeast. Um, I think I got it from Gusmer Industries. And uh, I don't know the cost, and perhaps I don't want to. <laughs> uh, I had been using um, a neutral champagne yeast for years, and so I was familiar with how that worked. And so this one, this is what they the, the previous cider maker had been using, and one thing that, you know, I, I had struggled with with the champagne yeast was uh, reduction in sulfur compounds. And so to have something turn around and be clean almost as soon as it fermented to dryness was sort of a revelation. And it was, it, it's actually been really nice. Um, and then being here at the distillery, you know, for, for people who know cider, one of the ways to correct reductiveness in cider which is sort of a smelly sometimes it can range sort of eggy or to me like a stomped weeds kind of character um, by adding a little bit of copper it binds with the uh, hydrogen sulfide compounds and reduces or eliminates those aromas and I was there's a trick where if you get cider like that you can put a penny in the glass to see if it bonds with the copper to see if it works and so I had done the penny trick and the penny worked and I was trying to remember how to calculate copper and I was walking around and sort of trying to figure out what to do and I looked up and there was a giant copper still in front of me and I thought well what if I put the cider in the penny <laughs> instead of putting the penny in the cider and it worked <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, wow. Not everybody has that at their No, fingertips. it was it was sort of Whoa. this amazing, you know, I think the sun came through and shined on the still for a moment and <laughs> of <that> course. Was, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So that well, was that was fun. That was definitely, you know, a switch and things to be able to do. No doubt. Wow. Yeah, that really opens up the doors. Yeah. And so now you uh, you're making one style of cider here. Yes. And it's uh 6. It's about 6.2, 6.5 yeah. percent, and it's just silo. We call it silo semi-dry, <laughs> and it's on the dry side of semi-dry, but um, yeah, it's just been, uh, we've, for this year, mostly while I was trying to get my feet under me, um, it's just been the one. It's 
we've had pretty good response to it. It's been selling consistently and for me in a really fortunate thing repeatedly. So we're getting a lot of repeat customers. Um, so that that's big for me. And um, so I, I feel great that that's happening. And so people are beginning to recognize that Silo Distillery has Silo Cider. And so we're going to be looking at some other options probably next fall. Um, I have to take up all of Aaron's uh, tank space for the distillation mashes. fall or this coming fall? This, this coming 2019 yeah. fall. Uh-huh. So um, we're looking at increasing by another 50% our volume, which means that I'm going to be taking up the spirits space. All the fermenters. <laughs> All the fermenters oh, well, for more time. Oh, wow, <laughs> trying to get ahead on so, the spirits. Yeah, we're trying I to figure it. out how to how to do that. But we may look at doing something, um, you know, either consider doing something sort of slightly heritage style. Um, Aaron and I both, she really likes sours, sour beers, sour ciders, and I've traveled to Spain and I love Spanish cider, so that might be something we would look at, or mm-hmm. maybe just something that um, you know echoes some of the things that we're doing with the the vodkas. We've got some ideas we're mm-hmm. toying with. Mm-hmm. And we're certainly going to dabble in brandy. We're going to try our yes. hand and see what happens. Oh, I yeah. hope so. Our first batch so. of brandy was a little funny because we sort of did it, it all on funny. the fly. It, sti- it started out. I mean, it, it was we put some cider in some single malt barrels that we had. Um, and it didn't go so well. Nope. It didn't turn out so great. Turned but out the, yeah. It was I don't like throwing anything away. So <laughs> we put it in the still and we distilled it. So we kind of did it backwards. It was like a yep. barrel aged cider that we distilled. And so it actually carried through a lot of the age, um, a lot of the barrel and the single malt characteristics. Uh, we didn't get very much out of it because it was sort of our first stab at it and we were just kind of goofing around. We weren't taking it too seriously. But it was kind of fun to see what the still would do. and what the product could do yeah um, and then we just like we played around with it as, as a U to V then we sweetened it as like a brandy schnapps and we still have some in the back yeah like eight gallons in the back <laughs> <laughs> so we're just trying to figure out what to do and uh like Aaron said you know we've got lots of uh, friends in the industry there's some people in Vermont that are making really exceptional brandies and so we want to go talk to them and taste their stuff and see what they're up to um and we're excited to do more. I'd love to look into a pomo, and we're right next to the Amtrak train tracks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and a, a great little tourist kind of. Oh yeah, experience. they call it the Artisans Park. Artisans that's Park, great. that's right. That's so, the. Aaron just brought out two two little. Uh, what well, what are those? Like little beakers. Yeah, so our little little mini beakers. beakers. Uh, this is. Well, I, I turn it off, so this is what I consider the end cut point. This is it at 190, and then this is what I call mini proof, which I, I like to have, I like to do, I like to have Nicole do. Um, it really, I brought it out because I thought it'd be interesting for you to see what happens with a mini proof. Basically, I just sort of added a rough ratio of um, clean water from our reverse osmosis tank to sort of bring it to what it would roughly be if it was in a bottle, and it kind of gives me an idea of what it's going to do, uh, taste and feel and um, smell like, and water will really open up the flavor profile of it. So you can't always just depend on, because if you were to compare these two, like the earlier sample and this one, you might not find too much different, but then you go and do a little tiny proof and it's not something you really want to keep collecting. It's not something I want to keep collecting. Right, right, it's right. a lot more bitter, um, the viscosity is uh, a lot higher once you add the water. Um, if you can feel and taste that, um, and that's roughly around 80 or 90 proof. Now I just put that on my lips because I wasn't afraid. Mm-hmm. I, I saw Nicole, as soon as Aaron brought this out, Nicole grabbed the beaker and kicked it back. I <laughs> smelled it and I tasted it, I paid attention. You enough time, your palate gets a little bit like, I don't want to call it calloused because that makes it sound like there's something wrong with it, but you get a little used to things. Like you start going to parties do. and being able to throw back a lot of stuff. I, I bet you do, yeah. You're a little less sensitive. Your tolerance to is up there. Yeah, you're professionals. Yeah. Yeah, well, I. As, as, as right. it should be. Exactly. And, you know, I had gotten to the yeah. point where I was very good at being a professional cider taster and drinker, and I sort of, you know, knew what my boundaries were. And the first couple of days that I was working here, I was like, whew. 
I'm gonna have to up my game. <laughs> you, know, you just do by accident. It's Roll right, yeah. yeah. Occupation hazard. Yeah, yeah. You start going to bars and people hand you shots of crappy, crappy booze and you don't make a face anymore. It's, it's like, <laughs> I'd like to hope I would still make a face about the crappy booze. <laughs> no, I mean, something you have a choice. I mean, you just puts one in front of you because it's like a, a 40th birthday or something. Ah, and right. Like, yeah, oh, fine. I don't know why you like this stuff. <laughs> well, 40th birthday should be drinking the good stuff. So That's uh, what I say. Uh, on this um, second beaker that you added the water to, what what should I be feeling on my hands there that you added the water to it? And it's more like fresh out of a bottle type of vodka. What should we have on We it? always have to keep in mind that there's still one more step. And I reiterate this to Nicole all the time is that you, you have to remember that this is a collection of a point throughout a process and it's a sum, it's a part of a larger whole. Um, so you have to have a little bit of um, perspective that you might collect a little bit of stuff that you don't really like on its own, but in the larger part of the 120 gallons that, or 120 liters that we just collected, it's not going to really show up much. And then we have still one more step of the carbon filtration, and the carbon's right. going to bond to a lot of that ickiness, right. Right. a lot of that bitterness, a lot of that sliminess mm -hmm. that you're feeling in just that one little uh, 80 milliliter sample. Um, and it's going to take it out in the plate filter, so it's not going to even show up at all. But mm -hmm. I don't want to add a lot of yucky parts to a larger sum, too. So we can get a little selective, and I'm sure there are times we could probably open up the cuts maybe a little bit more, but we like our final product a lot, mm -hmm. and a lot of other people do. And That's what counts. You know, it's it's efficient production, it's it's still cost-effective. Um, so it puts us in, gives us the ability to get a price point that we want to be in, high quality but affordable. Mm -hmm. So it meets all the standards that I need. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So what you are feeling, I mean, what I feel when I touch that sample is it's a lot slimier, it's a lot bit more bitter um, than I would typically mm -hmm. like the whole to be, uh, and I, I can tell from experience that there's um, some stuff in there I just really don't want. And I've hit a volume that's actually exceeded my expectation, like my, my average, mm -hmm. so I'm good with making the cut here. Okay. Um, and so does that mean that you shut down the system at this point? Yeah, I just turn the steam off. I turn okay. off the steam to the pot, and then I turn off the boiler. Um, and it's just sitting, and it, it'll work the rest of the stuff out of its system. I like to let it just do that and collect whatever else is left. Waste not, want not. Mm -hmm. um, and then what's left in the still, the low wines that are still left in the still, will get flushed down the drain. Um, that's it. Very cool. And Very then from cool. there, we'll proof it down to probably around 90. We'll add carbon, let it sit overnight, and tomorrow we'll run it through a plate filter. And that's it. 24-hour operation, and you're good to go with your product. I mean, mm -hmm. so different than doing fermentation. Oh, yes. I mean, it, it seems like there's... Oh, we still have that part. Well, <laughs> I know, but before. she's. Ch I think <laughs> yeah. you're talking about cider fermentation, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, cider yeah. fermentation. It's still even significantly yeah. shorter than that. Yeah, yeah it is. And... Um, can I ask, uh, how, how big is your still? It's is 350 it? gallons. 350 still. gallons, okay. How much cider are you producing per year at this point? This year, so with what we received in juice in fall of 2018, we got 4,000 gallons of juice. So um, we probably were down to 35. 3,700 gallons of cider okay. by the time, you know, the fermentation was done and... and we put some in barrels. That yeah, so... funny day. <laughs> yeah, you didn't right. have anywhere else to put well, it. Well, no, it was funny racking and sort of not we knowing, where like, the was, where the bottom so we were, was and oh. what the, you know... She thought it'd be, like, a couple gallons, so I was like, well, let's stick it in these barrels. And then all of a sudden, ten barrels later, I was like, are we at the bottom yet, Nicole? Because I'm running out of barrels. <laughs> and barrels. I thought it was going to wow. be, like, maybe 50 gallons. I ended up being, like, 140 100. gallons. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Did Some any of those working. barrels, did any of the juice stay in that barrels? Are you fermenting? For a while, and we would, we would definitely like to continue that because the flavor was great. Um, but that was one that it was great sort of up until I moved it and apparently I you know w with still figuring out the pumps and how everything worked um, I I'm, I basically just introduced too much oxygen and that's what mm. went wrong mm. so um, but it, it's the Cooper's that we have here and so that one was in the um, like Aaron was saying was in the single malt barrels and that was a really nice flavor and so I would like to try something I, I feel like the bourbon maybe would have too much char but I'm super curious to see how that's going to come out I've had 
some bourbon ciders that I've liked. I've had many that I have not liked. Um, and so for me, partly for my own personal flavor profile and partly by sort of, you know, following guidelines from uh, the U.S. Cider Makers Association and, you know, the Glint Cap judging and things like that, it's important to make sure that there's still a cider profile in relation to the barrel profile, but I think that we've got some spirits that would go and play really nicely with the cider. Well, hey, thank you for talking. Uh, oh, to yeah, it's so great to have you. Yeah, great to have you. Big tip of the glass to Aaron Nicole for hosting a Cider Chat at Silo Distillery. And some big news coming up. The New England Cider Tour is going out on October 31st. This is the second annual New England Cider Tour. And our last stop of the day is going to be at Silo Distillery, which is based in this park, if you will. It's actually called Artesian Park. And there are Vermont Cheesemakers, there is Blake Hill Specialty Preserves, where Nicole had recommended to me this jalapeno jam that she uses. I'm going to use it on some chicken. There's also Harpoon Brewery, which is now making cider under their new brand called City Roots. So a little like window of craft products right there in the park, including Silo distillery and we're going to be going there that's our last stop of the day before heading back to greenfield massachusetts uh we're also going to farnham hill in fact while i was at silo distillery i then zoomed up to farnham hill to get the okay from steve wood if you don't know steve wood well he's been on the podcast a couple times and is really one of those grandfathers of cider in (laughs) in the U.S. of A. And uh, he'll be meeting us and greeting us on October 31st. That's our first stop in the morning. And then we head over to Fable Farm Firmatory, a little south, to have a cider lunch. Uh, Well, we won't be just having cider, but it'll be a beautiful lunch at this lovely restored barn, meeting Christopher and Johnny, who are brothers, who do all the fermentation there. They have cider wine products, and vinegar. And in addition, we're also going to have Teddy Weber of a Tin Hat and possibly another cider maker that I can't yet confirm, but I think that cider maker will be coming too. So there is at least, let me see, one, two, three, four, possibly five, six cideries all in one day on this one-day tour out to New Hampshire and Vermont. This is going to be a kickoff event to the 25th annual Franklin County Cider Days happening in the hub area of Franklin County. Greenfield is the hub. So this is a great way to entice you to come out to my spot of Ciderville. Travel with me on this second annual New England Cider Tour. Go to ciderchat.com. Go to the menu that says Totally Cider. It'll drop down. You'll see New England Cider Tour. It'll give you more info on the makers. But all you need to know is if you want to go, send an email to me, Ria, at ciderchat.com. That's R-I-A, at ciderchat.com. Say you'd like to go. I will reply and let you know the details and sign you up. I do have a number of people who have been contacting me, and it looks like we're kind of getting more and more folks. So this is not not a trip that you want to delay on because I'm going to be closing this at the end of September. Again, it's a New England Cider Tour going out on October 31st, beginning and ending in Greenfield, Massachusetts. With our final stop at Silo Distillery, where we get to meet Aaron and Nicole and Team Silo. What better fun is that? Again, send an email to me, Ria at ciderchat.com. Well, that's another wrap, Ciderville. This was episode 189, and the Talking Palms and I have to start packing for our trip to London and West Country. Fish and chips and vinegar. Vinegar, vinegar, pepper, 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 salt. Okay, Perry, keep on practicing. (laughs) 
<laughs> this is Rhea Wincaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. There is a reason why we do it like this. We like cider. There is a reason, there is a reason We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets Smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet Oh yeah, we like cider There is a reason why we do 